Go ahead and turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter, chapter 5. And I'm going to be sharing this week on God's new creation. God's new creation. We're going to look at old creation and how it affected all of us in Adam. And then we're going to look at the new creation and how God has reversed in the second man, the last Adam, Jesus, and in the new creation, all the negative effects of the old creation. And so this will be a blessing to you, I promise. So I hope that you can be with us. I want to start with my beginning. I met Sue in May of 1980, and she was moving into the Haystack Apartments in Orlando, Florida. And I practiced on the tennis court at that apartment complex and also taught tennis on the side and was heading toward a career as a pro tennis player and specifically probably a coach or instructor. I had a gift. I have now discovered in hindsight that the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. Yes. I had a gift to teach and now I'm in God's will, perfect will for my life, and he's using that gift he gave me at birth to be a blessing to his body throughout the world. But I had perverted innocently that gift, but God didn't withdraw it. It's like I could teach tennis, and in some of the, some of the places that I taught, they would have different instructors, and if an instructor failed in teaching a student, they'd send the student to me because they wouldn't fail in my class. And so I was just prospering supernaturally in the teaching even of tennis. Well, when Sue moved into the Haystack Apartments, the Lord spoke to her and said she would witness to me. She didn't know me. She hadn't met me. Again, the tennis court was right where she parked. And so sometimes I'd see her going to work if I was there early and definitely in the evenings, I did most of my teaching and practice in the evenings. I would see Sue, she'd park right by the tennis courts. I think she did it on purpose. <laughs> but I'll never know. Amen. <laughs> and so anyway, our paths finally crossed and I had seen her coming and going and we hadn't even spoke. And so I just asked her, would she like to play tennis sometime? And she looked at me and she said, she can't play tennis. And I said something totally inappropriate because I was in a backslidden condition. And she agreed still to play, even though she couldn't play. And let me tell you something, Sue has never told a lie in her life. <laughs> she could not play. <laughs> it was terrible. I had never seen anybody that awkward or that bad. And one of the reasons I married her is I refused to fail at teaching her to play tennis. <laughs> so I'm trying to hit the ball softly to her and just, just get it to come back and not go over the fence and bounce off of the apartment complexes behind me. And so I'm running after balls the whole time. And so I'm just exhausted after a while. And so I asked her, did she have anything to drink? And she said, sure, let's go up to the apartment and, and get a drink. So I went up to her apartment and I walked into her apartment. And the minute I walked into her apartment, I knew this girl is different. You could sense the presence of God in her apartment and everything testified of Jesus. The magazines, they were all Christian type magazines, uh, the pictures, everything. So I panicked. I literally panicked. What have I got myself into? So I had to come up with an excuse. And so I said, do you, do you have a restroom I could use? Yes. And she showed me where the restroom was. So I go into the restroom and I'm trying to get my thoughts together, how to get out of this, this mess, because this is a good girl and she doesn't need to be around me at all. And sure enough, I go into the bathroom saints and there is a Bible on the back of the toilet. Who does that? <laughs> Who has a Bible? I mean, if you've got a Bible on the toilet, you love Jesus, amen. I mean, you are committed <laughs> unto death. And so I really panicked because I got to get out of here. So I came out of the restroom. I had a, 
had a plan, and she began to witness to me. And she was very polite, very nice. And she just began to share Jesus and his love for me. And, and I began to resist and, and tell her, you don't understand. I, I, I met the Lord early in my life, and I failed so miserably, and I've messed up so bad, I'm, I'm flawed that there's no hope for me. And she kept saying, there's always hope for everybody. And Jesus loves you. And I'm going, no, he really doesn't love me. Uh, and he's forgiven you. No, he's, he can't forgive me. And she kept saying, he's already forgiven you. That'll hit the rest of you later, especially this week as I go into it. And I'm thinking, how could he have already forgiven me? I haven't repented. And she's beginning to share the gospel for the first time in my life and how Jesus died for my sins 2,000 years ago, and that he didn't die for some of them, for most of them, for a few of them. He died for all of them. And that he's already extended forgiveness and unconditional love for me. And I started getting weak, and so I panicked and said, look, I got to go. Uh, and I lied. I said, I'll come back. And so I left. I told her, I need to go shower. Uh, and so I left. And the whole way, it just kept gnawing at me. And so I thought, I tell you what, I'm going to show that girl how I am flawed. I am going to go tell her everything wrong with me, every mistake I've ever made. And I'm going to prove to her that I'm an exception to the rule. And I came back and I began to just hammer her with how messed up I was. And she didn't flinch. And she just kept saying, God loved me. And it just went on and on. She is so hard-headed. And so I'm feeling weaker. Well, this went on from about five o'clock all the way to midnight. And she's got to get up and go to work in the morning. And, and I'm feeling bad that I've even been here this long. So I decide, look, I'll come back later. You need to go to bed and you've got work in the morning. So I step outside the door and down the hallway comes a streaker. Now, I know some of you are young. You don't know what that is. But this guy is butt naked and acting like a crazy man. And in the, in the 80s, chivalry had not died yet. And even though I was backslidden, even though I didn't want nothing to do with her now, I felt bad leaving with a madman running around naked outside. So I went back into the apartment. She started hammering me again with God's love and God's forgiveness. By four o'clock in the morning, she just wore me down. And I can't explain it to this day. Over four decades later, I just caved and began to repent, began to bawl. And I had an open vision of the cross in her living room. And I saw the cross. I saw Jesus. I can't tell you what he looks like after the flesh in his human form, but I saw Jesus. I knew it was Jesus on the cross, but I saw me inside of him. I literally saw me inside of him, and I saw God's wrath against me come on him in his body on the tree. I saw God punish him, for all, and I bawled just uncontrollably. Because he, he literally didn't just forgive my sin. He took my sin, all of it, in his body. And the father punished him, cursed him with the very curse of the law. And I saw it. And he died. And I died inside of him when he died. When he was buried, I was still in him. And I was buried. Then when he was raised from the from the dead and came out of the tomb, came walking out of the tomb. I saw me in him, listen, but it was a different me in him after the resurrection than the me I saw on the cross. Yeah. Then he ascended into the heavens and I was in him ascending. Then he was seated on the right hand of God Almighty on the throne and looked at me. It was as if I was out of him at that point and he turned and looked at me and said, we will rule and reign in the earth together forever. And man, I just lost it. It wrecked my world. It wrecked everything. Everything literally turned upside down in my life. I had never heard the gospel, though I had been in church my entire childhood, all the way up to 17 years of age. But what I saw was the gospel 
What I saw was the old creation coming to an end and the new creation being birthed through the first man raised from the dead. And I had a hunger for God's word I had never experienced. I literally lost sleep, uh, couldn't sleep for months, was in the Bible every minute of every day. And the Bible was the first book that I believe I read from cover to cover. I didn't even just read it from cover to cover and to the book of Revelation. I read it from the beginning all the way to and through the maps. I was so hungry for the Word of God. And it came alive to me for the first time. I'd, I'd read the Bible as a young person or tried to read it. And I'd always get stuck even in Genesis over Cain and Abel and him killing his brother and God being so merciful to him. It didn't make sense because I was raised under so much law and legalism. And so I'd get stuck there. If I'd get past that, I just couldn't get past the book of Leviticus. Man, some of you, you're on drugs. I can deliver you today. You don't need drugs to go to sleep. Read the book of Leviticus. <laughs> You'll be knocked out cold. And so I couldn't even make it through, through Leviticus. Now I've got this hunger for the word, and I wanted to understand what I saw. What was this I saw, God? And I discovered it's the new creation. I discovered 2 Corinthians chapter 5 came alive. It was the first scripture. Not only did I read the whole Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 came alive for the first time, and especially the entire New Testament. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I wasn't a good reader and had struggled through, through school. I was struggling through college, just an average student, but I had dyslexia. And I had it pretty severely. So it, it took me forever to read a sentence. I mean, I had to go so slow. And then retaining. I read the Bible, saints, in just a few months, again, from cover to cover, and didn't even realize what happened to me. God healed my brain through reading the scriptures and delivered me from dyslexia. Every now and then. Like, like Jacob that encountered God and got a broken hip to remind him of his weakness and his dependency on God. Every now and then, a word will flip, numbers will flip, some, some letters will flip on me. If you look at that book, Counterculture, the letters are flipped. That's me sticking it in the face of the devil, hallelujah. <laughs> and so here now, the Bible finally comes alive because of the gospel and me understanding the gospel. And I'm going to walk you through the death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and seating of Jesus and your connection, because it wasn't just me that was at the cross. You were at the cross. It wasn't just me that was in Jesus. You were in Jesus. It wasn't just me that died, was buried, ascended, and seated. You died in Christ and was buried and raised and seated. In 2 Corinthians chapter Chapter 5, verse 14, for the love of Christ compels us, King James Bible says, constrains us, because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. I used to read that, and it didn't make a bit of sense to me until the vision that I had in May of 1980. He said, if one died... The one that died was Jesus, and he's saying that when Jesus died, he didn't just die for him, he died for you. He didn't just die as him, he died as you. You died at the cross as much as Jesus died at the cross. If one died for all, then all died. That's the New King James. Let me just quickly go to the... To the to the King James Bible, uh, I like the way the King James Bible says this, for the love of Christ constrains us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. That never made a lick of sense to me. Then we're all dead. And that he died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. I'll go back to the New King James now. Verse 15 there. And he died for all that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. 
Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new, and now all things are of God who hath reconciled us unto himself by Christ Jesus. I would hear that in church, or I would just in trying to read my Bible, read that and draw a total blank because I didn't understand I was spirit and had a soul and had a body and that there's a part of me that changed the day I made Jesus the Lord of my life and that's what I saw in the, in the vision. No one had ever taught me that I am created in the image and likeness of a triune God. We don't serve three gods. We serve one God. Hear ye, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One God, but in three distinct separate manifestations. I'm one person, but there are three distinct manifestations of me that are separate. I am a spirit being. That's why I will live forever. Somebody said the other day, well, I, I got saved last week. I'm going to live forever. No, no, you were going to live forever no matter what. Thank God you got saved. Well, you've, you're, you're picking it up on this side, finally. <laughs> Salvation doesn't mean you're going to live forever. Salvation determines where you're going to live forever. Spirit beings live forever. That's why the devil who is a spirit being has to be jailed in the jail called hell because he's a, he's a spirit. Angels are spirits. And so there had to be a place, a jail in the spirit world for renegade, rebellious spirits. And so you are a spirit being. Everyone is a spirit being. We have a soul. That's our mind, our will, our intellect, our reasoning capacities. That's a part of our soul. And then we all live in a body. I just wish somebody would have helped me understand soul and body. Because I did kind of know I had a soul, personality, intellect, emotions, feelings. And I knew I was in a body. But because I hadn't been taught the new creation, I didn't understand old creation and my connection to it. I was dominated totally by my body and part of my soul, my emotions especially, my feelings. And so I could contact my body. I could look in a mirror and weep. <laughs> and I didn't like my body. And... and all of my inferiorities and complexes and insecurities, they all came out of only knowing me after the flesh. This is who I am. How many of you have at least grown enough in Jesus to know this isn't who you are? Amen. This is a glove. And some of you have got a sloppy looking glove. I love you. But I didn't appreciate my glove. I didn't like anything about me. I didn't like my voice. I didn't like my, my size. I didn't like my, I hated my hair. I hated my hair. No, you don't understand. I hated my hair. I had this afro that went from shoulder to shoulder in high school. And it was so thick, I could jump in a swimming pool and come up and it would still be perfect. <laughs> I was the envy of the entire African nation. And the girls just loved my hair. They, they got, hey, amen, sister. And, and, and they talked me into dyeing it one time, and it was so black, it was blue. I cried for weeks. They talked me into ironing it one time, trying to iron it to get all the kinks out. I looked like Bozo the Clown. It was terrible. I remember early in the ministry when I hadn't cut it fully yet. It looks really good now. I believe I received. I believe I received. People would come up to me and go, is that natural? And I would just look perplexed and say, you mean to tell me somebody would pay to have this done to their head? <laughs> of course it's natural. Hated it, everything about me. And so then I could contact my soul with my reasoning and my emotions, but they were out of whack most of the time. Go to church my whole life and nobody tell me I have a spirit. I'm a spirit being. 
And that the part of me that got born again, the part of me that changed, the part of me that you can only connect now by faith is your spirit, is your spirit. Never had heard it. And after the vision of the cross, going back to this scripture was one of the first ones the Lord took me to. I began to see we are spirit, soul, and body. Go to 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And once I began to see who I was in the spirit and that I am a spirit being and that my spirit is real, even though I can't feel it, even though I can't contact my spirit with my intellect or my five physical senses, just like God is a spirit. Did you know you don't contact God with your five physical senses? It's a part of what's wrong with many spirit-filled churches, with many Pentecostals. We were constantly trying to connect with God with our feelings. And until you felt something, God wasn't in the room. And the way you felt something was always odd. Again, I was raised pretty much Pentecostal holiness. So anytime the Holy Spirit would come on somebody, they would get strange. <laughs> Ooh. Eyes would get big and, and, and they talk about, the, I, I feel the Holy Ghost. And I'm thinking, I don't want to have nothing to do with the Holy Ghost <laughs> if it's going to make you weird and strange. And so I didn't understand and no one would talk about these things. And all these things are coming alive in a matter of months in the Word of God to me, how that God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit yes. and in what? Truth. You contact God by faith in the truth, by loyalty to the truth, to embracing truth with all of your heart. And yes, many times God can be felt and you will sense him in your senses and with your senses, but that doesn't mean he wasn't there when you didn't sense anything. And so these things were just huge in my life. Verse 19 of 1 Thessalonians 5, do not quench the spirit. Do not quench or grieve the Holy Spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Test all things. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Isn't that pretty powerful that as believers we're encouraged to abstain from every form, King James Bible says, even the appearance of evil. I bring up evil in the church and people freak out and get offended, have embraced so much evil that we've forgotten the admonition. We're, we're, we're not supposed to be anywhere near evil, much less celebrating it, embracing it, imposing it on the masses. Verse 23 now, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. King James Bible says holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful who will also do it. Also do what? Preserve my spirit completely. Preserve my soul, my mind, my will, my emotions, my intellect, my reasoning faculties, and my body to the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I begin to see here, praise God, there's a part of me that I had to come to know by the truth, which is God's word, and by the spirit. And that process just took off. We call it knowing who you are in Christ, knowing who you are now in your spirit. And being renewed now in your mind to who you are on the inside and not be so caught up in the outside. And yet, man, the culture is totally consumed with the flesh, totally consumed with appearance, totally consumed with gender now, totally consumed with race, flesh, your outer man and judging one another after flesh. 
instead of the church now being this counterculture and realizing we need reacclimated and come to know each other, not after our financial status, not after our flesh, not after our hairdos, not after our clothes, not after the color of our skin, not after our gender, but come to know one another now after Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. Boy, we're going to have a good week. We're going to have a lot of fun. We're going to grow. We're going to transition, many of us, at least to another place. No matter what place you're at now, I promise you, if you're here and can be here, we're going to transition to renewing our minds to more who we are in Christ than who we're not after the flesh. After the flesh. Spirit, soul, and body. And this was, this was something that was in type and shadow throughout the whole Old Testament of the three parts of man. Let me go backwards. I do that. How many of you at least have heard you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? You're the tabernacle of God now. You're God's temple in the earth. Well, one of the things that helped me was go back and look at the old covenant temple and the old covenant tabernacle, even the tent of Moses. Then the temple was designed the same way into three different parts. You had the outer court, which anybody could come into the outer court and intermingle with the outer court. Then you had the holy place, and that was designated for the priest and all the sacrifices. Then you had the holy of holies, and there was this thick veil that separated the holy of holies from the holy place and from the outer court. One tent, three parts, holy of holies, and the Shekinah glory of God dwelt in the Holy of Holies. It had the tabernacle, excuse me, it had the uh, Ark of the Covenant in there with the Ten Commandments inside of it and the rod of Aaron that budded and the manna that came down from heaven had two angels and a mercy seat over the top and two angels bowing toward each other on both ends. When Jesus was raised from the dead, there were two angels on both sides or ends of the bed facing each other. Jesus had become the tabernacle, eternal tabernacle of God. The mercy seat is Jesus himself, hallelujah, that cleanses us of all of our sin and makes us acceptable with God. And so the Shekinah glory of God dwelt in there and only the high priest and only once a year could the high priest go into the Holy of Holies because it was so sacred, it was so holy. Listen, nothing could come out of there that wasn't of God. And nothing could get in there that wasn't of God. The high priest had to go through. I mean, it was amazing the ceremonial rituals that the high priest had to go through to get cleansed, to make sure there was no sin in his, in his heart, at least for those moments and, 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 and in, his, in his life. And he would have to go in there to make that atonement for Israel on that mercy seat once every year. And he couldn't go in there without blood and a rope. They tied a rope around his leg. Because if he goes in there and he hasn't properly prepared to be in the unveiled presence of God, he'll drop dead and, and, and nobody, nobody can go in and get him. That's why Israel wasn't a democracy. Who's going to run for office after that? Can you imagine if every politician died the first time they lied? We'd be free again, hallelujah. We would be America again. So he had bells at the, at the bottom of his, of his garment, and they would, they would jingle. And he would go in there, and people would stand. The priest would stand right outside that, that thick veil and listen, and, and he would sway. The high priest would sway, and it would be jingle, 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 jingle. And the, and the priest would be listening. They'd be shouting out, it's going good. It's going good. Jingle, jingle. Things are well. We're about to be atoned, all our sins. Jingle, jingle. But then if you heard jingle, jingle, <laughs> you got to drag the dude out. <laughs> Once I saw the mystery of God dwelling among his people in a tent, 
that was three parts? How can God and the unveiled glory of God, saints, dwell in a tent and not blow the tent up? Somehow or another, there was a mystery, and God sanctified that third part, sealed it, where God in his fullness could dwell and it not burn up the holy place and it not burn up the outer court and it not kill everybody that was in the outer court. Do you realize you're that temple now and your spirit is the holy of holies? Your soul is the holy place and your body's the outer court. In the outer court, we engage with sin all day long. We are saturated with evil and darkness all around us, and it affects our bodies. It can, if we allow it, affect our holy place, our minds, our soul, our emotions. But I'm here to tell you that nothing comes out of your spirit except what is of God, and nothing can get in your spirit but what is of God. That's why... When you get born again and you sin, you don't have to go get born again again and get born again, 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 again. Because when you sin now, or if you sin now, it affects your body, it affects your soul, but it doesn't affect the righteousness that you are now in Christ, in your spirit. This is how you can jump up from sin and run to God, not from God. When you understand he didn't leave you, he didn't forsake you. He doesn't break relationship off with you because of sin. If he did, which sin would it be? I'm not condoning sin and sin is dangerous and sin is deadly. But God has atoned for our sins in the one sacrifice of Jesus Christ one time for sin forever. And God will never leave or forsake you now. Hallelujah. Because he's in the holy of holies. Everywhere you go, you're carrying God in the holy of holies. And it doesn't blow you up because it's sealed. There's a mystery. I remember I was in a meeting one time. I'll be sharing hopefully a lot of stories. I want to I wanna share some of these stories as I begin to navigate through all this. But man, this lady, I just wish people would come up to me and ask me a question and be sane. <laughs> but a lot of times people will come up and ask me a question and immediately try to put me on the defense because their attitude's bad. And, and anyway, this lady hit me up and she's trying to receive this. And, and I was there for a whole week. And anyway, at the end of the week, she was just still upset. And she came up to me and said, well, I just want to know one thing. Why can't I feel it? <laughs> you just want to go, I don't know. <laughs> but I was nice. And the Lord spoke to me. It blessed me so much. You know, we want to believe God speaks to us all the time, and I believe he's communicating all the time, but we're not always hearing. And so it always blesses me when I hear the clear word of the Lord for people. It just, I never take it for granted. And she goes, well, why can't I feel it? And the Lord spoke to me and said, tell her good thing. I was like, whoa, what does that mean? And I felt like the Lord said, I didn't ask you to ask me what it means. I asked you to tell her good thing. So I just decided I'm going to tell her good thing, not even knowing what I'm talking about. So I looked right at her and I said, well, it's a good thing. And she goes, what do you mean it's a good thing? I can't feel it. Then the word of the Lord came to me and said, if it wasn't sealed and it wasn't veiled in the flesh of Jesus, it would destroy you. It would burn you up. You would be burnt to the toenail, fried, nothing but a pile of ashes as a testimony for the whole body of Christ. Don't buck God. She acted about like some of you are acting right now that I don't receive that. It's a good thing, saints. You can't Feel it. It's a good thing it's sealed because we're talking about the fullness of God dwells on the inside of you and it's God's mercy that you don't feel it. Quit trying to feel it and start believing it. Amen. Amen. Go to John chapter three because Jesus explained this. And how can I hear this scripture over and over in church and not have a clue? I'm embarrassed to admit that. I know all of you come to church and you hear the word of God and angels sing. 
gold dust falls out of the sky. You just leave so blessed. Man, I used to leave church so confused. It's like, well, what does that mean? And back when I was young, this may be a little strange for some of you, we didn't have any teachers. Everybody was a preacher. Somebody said, well, what's the difference between preaching and teaching? About a half hour. <laughs> preaching is proclaiming. Teaching is explaining. I can proclaim it in 20 minutes, but to explain it takes more time. And no one taught. I remember when I felt called to the ministry shortly after this vision, and I forsook everything and was going to fulfill the will of God no matter what. I had so much reservation that I thought God was calling me to do. I, I had visions of doing exactly what I'm doing right now, seeing people by the thousands and just talking. And if you'll talk to people in public speaking, it's one of the greatest fears that you can have is speaking publicly. And I had that fear. And all I could think about was I had to preach. And all the models I had were like a Brahma bull slinging snot. I can remember when the preacher would, they always had a, a handkerchief because they sweat like a, a pig. And so, so they get to preaching and they would pull the white flag, I called it out. That was the surrender flag. Once that white flag comes out, you better get to that altar as quick as you can get there, hallelujah. And they're screaming and hollering and, and you, you have questions. I do. I know you don't. You understand everything. I get it. But about, well, what does that mean? And now we're sniffing snot over here. And slinging snot about that. And so I'm like, well, what, how does that work? How, how? And then by the time you even process in your brain and you're struggling with dyslexia to boot, you don't, uh, okay, you can't identify. So I knew I was just called to teach, to just share, to just communicate life, to just speak and my words be spirit and, and life and that they would change hearts by the truth not me slinging snot like a Brahma bull. Now, every now and then I get excited. I preach by accident. If I get excited, I sling a little snot. <laughs> but it is, it is by accident, not by design. So how could I sit in church? And this is one of the most important passages in the Bible. John chapter 3. This is Nicodemus sneaking around by night. Doesn't want to be seen with Jesus. He'll be persecuted made fun of by his peers if he's seen even talking to Jesus. So he comes by night, ask a question. It appears Jesus just ignored the question. I don't have time. I'm running out of time to set it all up. But anyway, he asked a question and Jesus said unto him, most assuredly, verse three, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You can't see God's kingdom. See doesn't mean like with these eyes, it means understand. You can't understand the kingdom. You can't perceive God's kingdom. You can't understand how he, how he works, his principles that govern his kingdom. You can't even see it till you get born again. Look at Nicodemus's response. And I used to make fun of him, but I've been in church a long time now. He said unto him, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus said, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> that's probably what he should have said. Probably what he was thinking. Because he went on to talk about how can you be a Pharisee and not know these things? Notice what he did. Except you be born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. He looked at his body initially, instantly, and was so flesh dominated, so flesh conscience that he said one of the dumbest things recorded in scripture. Can a man get back in his mother's womb? Can he crawl back up into his mother's womb and be born over? I mean, that's just dumb. And yet he was sincere. He had no concept of spirit. He had no concept of the spirit world, of how we're spirit beings. Jesus goes on to say, 
Verse 5, most assuredly, I say to you, unto you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Mark this, that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of Spirit is Spirit. Your first birth was flesh, and we all came by water. Now, some people interpret this as water baptism. I don't want to get into that. I believe that when he said and explained it, that which is flesh is flesh, that which is Spirit is Spirit, we all came in our first birth by water. You, you, you wouldn't be here had your mother's water not broke. You lived and was surrounded by water in your mother's womb, and that water had to break, and that's your first birth, and it's flesh. Then he said, I'm not talking about your flesh. I'm not talking about your outer man. I'm not talking about your glove. That which is spirit is spirit. The new birth is the rebirth of the human spirit. It's your spirit that was dead in sins and trespasses being born over again in the image of Jesus. Flesh can't produce anything but flesh. Spirit doesn't produce anything but spirit. Your born again spirit is not an inferior spirit. It's not a second rate, second class spirit. It's not even a baby spirit. It is the spirit and in union with the spirit of Christ, a full grown person. And the only immaturity we have isn't that we got a little baby spirit that has to mature and become an adult. No, we have to get renewed in our mind to the new spirit, the born again spirit, the spirit that is joined to Jesus, one with the Lord, flesh of his flesh, bone of his very bone. We're immature in understanding. We're immature in application. And that's what the maturity in my life has been all about. Whether you know it or not, your maturity is learning who you are in Christ and being more dominated by your spirit than your emotions or your body. Man, that's powerful. That is so powerful. Man, I didn't get very far. We'll start, we'll start there tonight. When you get born again, it can be, it can be radical, it can be very emotional, but it doesn't have to be. Sometimes people get born again, and I mean, it's really dramatic the encounter they have with God and then the ripping out of your old heart and the putting in of a new heart, a new spirit and God's spirit that Ezekiel talked about. Other people, it's just a decision. It is a conscious decision that I'm making Jesus Lord of my life. And whether you feel something or not, if you've made Jesus the Lord of your life and if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that in other words, he's alive, and you confess him as your Lord, the Bible promises that with your heart, man believes unto righteousness. We don't work our way into righteousness and holiness. We believe that with our heart, we believe unto righteousness and with our mouth, our confession, we are saved. So if you've done that, maybe you haven't felt it. That's okay. Maybe you've doubted it. That's okay. But it's not okay not to believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and not to confess him as Lord. If you haven't done that, you need to do that. This is how we become a new creation. This is how we get born again. This is how we see the kingdom of God. This is how we now spend eternity with God, not separated from God. And so I want you to bow your heads. Father, if there's anyone within the sound of my voice, either on the broadcast, even right now as I speak, or in the room, or the overflow room, or wherever they may be or listening right now, if they've not made Jesus Lord of their life, made that conscious decision and commitment, an act of their free will, I want to be saved. I want to be forgiven. I want to spend eternity with God. We have to all decide that. If they haven't done that, Holy Spirit, Give them the courage to make that decision right now, not to put it off, not to listen to those voices of I'm not ready. If we could get ready, we wouldn't need to be saved. We need to be saved because we're not ready. 
And so, Father, if that's anyone, give them the courage to make a commitment. If that's you, with every head bowed, we're going to have two calls. The first one, if you've never made a commitment to Christ, you're not born again. You haven't received a born-again spirit, a new spirit, or become this new creation. It's just that simple. You believe in your heart. God raised Jesus from the dead and confess him as Lord. I'll lead you in that prayer right where you sit. If that's you, just slip up your hand, though, if you need to do that today. Anybody, just slip up your hand, make sure I see it, and then we'll move to the second call. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Lord, I just believe everybody within the sound of my voice has made Jesus Lord, so help us to understand this week. What does that really mean? How does that look? And how does that affect my eternity? If you're here and you've made that commitment, maybe as a child, but you've lost your confidence, you don't feel you're serving God like you need to serve God, or maybe you're doubting, am I really saved? I want to pray for you before I close. I want to go into this week with all of us in faith in the cross. If you need prayed for, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand and you need that confidence that you are saved. Raise it and let make sure I see it. And you can put it down. You can put your hand down there, here, there. Thank you, Jesus. All right. Those that raised your hand, I'm going to pray for you. Those of you that did not raise your hand, you cannot bootleg my prayer. <laughs> it won't work for you. You had a chance to say, I do, to get married. And you can't, we're not having a shotgun wedding now. So you just agree with me for those that raise their hand. Father, those that raise their hand, I've had those seasons in my life where I wavered, where I didn't feel it, where I'd done things, messed up, fallen, and just doubted. The enemy pounded my head. Thank you for the confidence you've given me through the Word of God that I'm not saved by my works before I'm born again or after. I'm saved by God's grace and your tender mercies. Those that raise their hand, I just pray for that confidence to come back. I pray for that assurance. I rebuke doubt in Jesus' name. I release faith, the spirit of faith. Faith is a spirit. And I thank you for that spirit being here this week. I thank you in advance for that confidence growing this week, that assurance of their salvation. Thank you for healings. Lord, I'm believing for signs and miracles and wonders. You are a God of miracles. The new birth is a miracle, but you care about our souls and you care about our bodies. And this week we're going to see signs and wonders. And I thank you in advance for them in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Did you get anything today? <laughs> Hallelujah.